Now, I just want to read to you uh, the latter part of chapter 30. I didn't include it in the first part because, uh, well, I didn't, but I'm going to read from verse 34 down to the verse Mark 38. probably realize why when I start. Um, Then the Lord said to Moses, make fragrant spices, gum resin, uh, onacha, and galdanum, and pure frankincense, all in equal amounts, and make a fragrant blend of incense. The work of the perfumer, it is to be salted and pure and sacred. Grind some of it to powder and place it in front of the ark of the covenant law in the tent of meeting, where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you. Do not make any incense with this formula for yourselves. Consider it holy to the Lord. Whoever makes incense like it is to enjoy its fragrance must be cut off from their people. What does uh, this chapter speak to us about? There, there is many different aspects within it, the anointing oil and the basin for washing, the atonement money for the priests and so on. But the particular aspects that I want us to look at are the incense, the incense and really the, um, the burning of it and what it means for us today. You might think, He's gone all Catholic on me, and uh, he's going to start swinging about a incense. But uh, no, I'm not about to. But particularly that last part, um, which I, I want to speak to early, the fragrance being made of a certain aroma, and uh, it's it's made in a particular way, and it's only that way that can be performed in in the altar area. Very often we get caught up in our prayers as being one particular way. And the island isn't unusual like anywhere else. Uh, Regionally, you find that there's places where there's prayers done in a certain way and in denominations, there's prayers done in a different way. They're used from the common book of prayer, or they're used in different circles from different liturgies. And the one thing that I find people, um, I don't know, do they get mixed up in it? Do they get caught up in it and all that? Is that prayer prayer for a lot of people has to be so, it has to be precise, and it has to be uh, correct. And I'm not saying that that's wrong, and I'm not objecting to that, Um, but I want to try and come from an understanding uh, where I came from. When I was brought up in the Brethren, we uh, didn't have any prepared prayers of any description. And uh, you could have been at a moment's cause asked to pray. And also, it was, also, it was always laid upon particularly the brothers' hearts that, that if they felt the need to pray at any time, they could do so. So even if you had a visiting speaker and he would be leading the service, he, a brother could then ask, can I pray? can I pray? And it was allowed. It was, it was so encouraged because they felt it was led by the Spirit. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that written formats aren't led by the Spirit because we, we do believe that the Spirit is working in and through our lives at all times. But one thing I want to ask you is, in your prayer life, do you get caught up in the aspects that shouldn't bother you? Do you get caught up in praying right? Do you get caught up in praying only for yourself? Or do you get caught up in praying only for others? Or all of these things. I want to put that out to you tonight. 
because here we see a format placed before us. We see a, a principle, and it's a principle that is commonly known across Scripture that we should pray often, all of the time. Now, we see from the beginning of this and the end that there's not only a way that the incense is to be prepared and made, so formulated, that at the beginning of the chapter, we see that there's a, a timing implied to this. And it basically says that Aaron is to light the fragrance incense altar when he goes in in the morning and at the evening. So the prayer of the people, the fragrant incense, is rising up to God at all times, as best it can be. So, we see from Paul's teaching that he says, pray continually, pray all the time, pray in different ways, pray for the people, pray for me, pray for this. So, there's a, an aspect of realizing that it doesn't matter which way we pray, it's whatever the Lord lays on our hearts to pray is right and proper towards Him. So, other things that bother us catching us up in this wrong sort of theology. I don't know. I put it out there to you. I, I want you to think about it because we are to test things and we are to look at Scripture and see how it lays out in our hearts. One thing we do see from this, though, is there is a, a procedure, and the Lord laid it upon the heart of Moses. This is how I want it made. This is how I want it set out, and this is when I want it, all of the time, to your best ability. And there it is before us, it gives us a great understanding that God wanted a right relationship with His people through prayer. So, I ask you again, how is your prayer life? Does it something that bothers you and bugs you and constantly is niggling at the back of your head? Is it something that you know the Lord is speaking to you about? If truth be told, we all could do a little better with our prayers. We all could speak to God in a more productive way. Every preacher that you talk to generally says, I could pray a lot better than I do. Because they get caught up in many of the other things of life that, let, that they let bother them. And that's true, I believe, of many believers. The, the obstacles and the, the obscurities of life, the, the things that are there to drag us away are very often in front of us, not behind us, where they once were many years ago. Our priorities have become more about living this life than speaking to the Lord. And that's why God set up this procedure. I suppose Moses had a, a a great conversation through prayer with God. It seemed to be continuous, and he could approach Him again and again. But he knew of the people, because when we consider the Exodus, he knew of the people that there was a cry 
from within them, a cry of desperation to get out of slavery. But they themselves didn't know how that was. So there was, at some stage, we realize there was um, an indifference between them and God. But Moses came in, and the character that he was, he was he was brought into this situation to put right that slavery and lead them out. So why was Moses so good at being able to speak with the Lord, and yet God had to put in place this principle and these procedures so that the people could pray to God? Well, Aaron was instructed to burn incense on the, on the altar morning and evening, every day. We see that in verse 7 and 8. He was given the recipe of that incense to be burned, and he was even told how the fire was to be used to burn that incense. And it was all put together in an offering in the sanctuary. Nothing else was to, that was not to be used for anything else. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest is to put the blood of, on the horns, so there's to be a sacrifice and a, a cleansing of even the implements that were there before them. And the one thing that he says to them, this is to be a most holy to the Lord. This is to be most holy to the Lord. And you are to treat it most holy. It is to be a holy thing for you. And we pause for a minute in our own hearts and think, is that how we see prayer? If it was to be the defining rope, a defining rope that you were holding on to while hanging off the edge of a cliff, if prayer was to be a rope while you were hanging off the edge of a cliff, would your prayers be sufficient for you to climb back to the top? The question I was asked when I was a teenager at the camps, and it was quite explicitly done in the way in which they, they held, they tied a bit of rope to the top of the pole in the big male key, and one of the tent leaders went up it and hung on. Now, I remember quite clearly he hung on for about 10 minutes. He wrapped his legs around his feet. Every part of his body was entwined with this rope, clinging on for grim life. And the point was put, if if that rope was your prayers, would it be strong enough to hold you there? To allow you to climb up to the top? God's primary desire of His people is that they be holy. And what we see throughout the Bible is that God comes to a stage where He, he sees some of the applications, some of the procedures, He sees them as just rituals to the people. Look at what He says in, um, in Isaiah 1 verse 13, stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense are detestable to me. More important to Him 
and burning the proper incense at the proper time with the proper fire and the proper implements was having a proper heart towards God. The procedures, the implements, the the right mixture was put in place so that the people of God would respect that incense as being holy, as, as being pure, of a pure aroma to God. And you very often hear the, the understanding that prayer is a sweet-smelling aroma to God. Now, we all love sweet-smelling scents, this, the candle industry in the last 10 years seem, must have gone through the roof because people are putting different scents in a candle, and everybody wants to buy them and give them as a present and receive them and so on. And I can imagine that God, on a, on a good day, perhaps it's a Sunday, perhaps it's a Wednesday night, but I can just imagine that God when he hears those prayers, it is like a sweet-smelling aroma arising to heaven. In Scripture, incense is associated with prayer. In a strong way, David prayed, may my prayer be set before you like incense. In Psalm 141, verse 2, that we sang. In his vision of heaven, John saw around the throne, they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Revelations 5, verse 8. prayers of God's people. When we look at the priest for offering, Zachariah, in in Luke 1 verse 10, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And it was that sweet smell and aroma that rose to heaven. The, the altar of incense for us, it's, it's a symbol of the prayers of God's people. And, and our prayers ascend to God as like smoke. That day when, I don't know whether we'll get it this year, I hope we don't, where you get a, a smell in the air and it's it's the fire of the heather somewhere where they've been burning. And you get it wafting along and you know particularly what it is. That was the prayers of the people rising to God. He knew it was His people. And more so than anything, He set that in place so that we also could apply it to our lives and see that it's to be not something of a, just a cry of need, but it's to be a cry, an intercessory cry for the people. When we look at the different prayers in the Bible, The first thing that always comes to mind is that the disciples knew how well Jesus prayed. They asked Him how to pray. Teach us, Lord. Teach us, Lord. It was like they knew He was in the courtyard in the courtyard of the tabernacle of God. He was in that place where he was about to approach his God and Father 
and his aroma of prayer was sweet. Now Christ's death gives us that ability, that aroma. He has put his blood again on the horns of the altar. And whereas the the priest here did it once a year, Christ has done it. And it's no longer do we need to do any of that procedure. We can stop at a moment. We can we can go and find a room. We can, we can stand in a field and we can raise our voice to the Lord. A picture of, a, or a, of our advocate is for me one of the most um, expressional. It's one of the most beautiful and defi- delightful things that Scripture tells us. And if you do have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7 and verse 25. That's where we find this understanding from. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. There's an eternal promise in there. Eternal because always. Always is not just a present tense or a past tense, it's a future tense. He always lives to intercede for them. Not just on Monday mornings, not just on Sundays when we're trying to get ourselves to go out to the to church. Not just when there's trouble in the family, always, because He always lives to intercede for us. God, through Moses, asked Aaron to light the incense of the tabernacle, of the, of the courtyard, so that the people's representation of prayers would be there, lit forever, day and night, for generation to generation. There's, a, there's not just a, a one tense there, there's an all tense. There's a past, present, and future. Today, if you have any doubt that the Lord Jesus is watching over you. He ever lives to intercede for you and me and our young people and our old people. Those who are lost, those who are wandering, those who are sick and ill. It's beautiful to know that God considers not only the prayers of believers as a sweet smell because of Christ, but it's the fact that those prayers, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the intervention of Christ and His death and His sacrifice of blood, gives us a full assurance that He is telling the Father each and every one of our needs always. Now, 
I want to finish, a, not finish preaching, uh, well, finish preaching, but I don't want to finish the service a little bit early because I want us to use um, with that notion of prayer and, 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 and accessory prayer, I want us to uh, read and pray before we close tonight because, well, we can never do enough praying. And it's particularly that I want to pray the Psalm 86. And uh, for one reason or another that when we go into this week, and it just so happens that we're going to be teaching the kids um, the Psalms in maybe it's a different context, but the, the effect of it hopefully will have some lasting uh, motion for their lives. So I'm going to read Psalm 86, and really I want to apply it as a prayer to God that um, these things would be evident in this week to come. And uh, this is the prayer, a prayer of David, Psalm 86. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Among the gods there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord, my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love towards me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. Arrogant foes are attacking me, O God. Ruthless people are trying to kill me. They have no regard for you. But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength on behalf of your servant. Save me because I serve you just as my mother did. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Let's bring our time to a close in prayer. Lord God, the, the words of David very often sum up how we feel in our lives. And Lord, there is times when we feel desperate, we feel um, desolate because of the way in which the world is leaning towards an ungodly projection. Lord, we, we know that there are many in our communities that have turned away from you. We know that our youth, Lord, are struggling to find sanctuary in your house. We know that, Lord, there are those who are ill and sick and those who are worried after a time of pandemic. We know there are those, Lord, who struggle with life and the longevity of it, Lord. We know there are those who indeed have no hope and no desire for your church. They look at your word as being blank, 
and aimless. They look at your word as being meaningless for their lives. But yet, God, we know, we know deep down that if it were not for your ways, if it were not for your deeds, if it were not for your word, we would be caught in the fire, ravaged by the heat, scorched, Lord, by the arrows that fly past us. Lord God, we come to you praying for those in need. They might not know that need, Lord, but we know that they're of a, a lost eternity if they don't trust in you. We pray particularly this week for our young people, for the youth where the posters have come through the letterbox, and Lord, we ask that you would indeed turn their eyes towards those days and times. And then indeed, Lord, we would be a light on the hill that shines brightly to show your Son, Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you would capture their hearts for a moment and bring them to a place of recognizing that your church, Lord, your church is alive and it is well. And Lord, there is salvation to be found within your courts. Lord, for a moment, let your courts come alive to them. Let the, the pulls and the, the different aspects of this world, Lord, be dull for a moment. Let the video games and the, the different things on television, let the sports, let the, all the things that entice them away from you, Lord, let them be dull for a moment till you capture their hearts, till you capture their thoughts, to you bewilder them with your light and that their eyes glint of your purpose. Lord, we pray that you would go before us in all we do. We pray for the weather, Lord, that it would be fair for us, that enjoyed in, we would enjoy a time of fellowship together on Saturday, that, Lord, our family service on Sunday would be a joyous time where we recall the things that have been taught to the children. Lord, let your psalms ring out through the different generations. And Lord, may we know your grace and your mercy and your peace and indeed your wonder, a wonder of salvation in our hearts and in the people who we love and care for. So Lord, go before us in all that we ask of you. Go before us, Lord, in our prayers so that we will know what to pray for in the coming days and the coming weeks and indeed for those who we love and care for. Lord, as we sing our last item of praise, may it be, may it be a remedy that rings throughout our ears and our heart over the next week. And may it remind us that you Lord, want to hear the cries of our hearts, no matter how they come out of our mouths. Your Holy Spirit, Lord, we're told in Corinthians, will interpret it for you. Lord, that is a blessing. It is a wonder, but it is precious to each and every one of our souls. Lord, go before us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to sing our last item of praise. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer.
What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs we bear. What a privilege to God. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what is we often forfeit. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on you and remain with you and all whom those you love and pray for both this day and forevermore. Amen.